<clears throat> Hello, podcast listener. Welcome to, uh, uh Julian? Uh, what does this say? Oh, uh, uh, that says, welcome to season five of The Long-Winded One. Why are we reading an intro for this guy? We should be talking about our books. Wait up, guys. I'm coming. Well, it's about damn time. <sighs> Did I miss the intro? No, Dave. Cooper is still trying to read the first line of the intro. What? Coops? Illiterate. What did you call me? That's it, Dave. I'm really angry. Cooper, I don't think a barbarian rage will help you with your reading. Uh, Let's just finish up the intro, and maybe the long-winded one will talk about our books in the process. Uh, Julian, did you just try a diplomacy check on us? Well, maybe. Uh, Here, let me try. Uh, join us this season as we talk about lit RPG and game lit. Uh, here, Tim, your turn. Fine. In this first episode, Robert Bevan and Jonathan Sleep will talk about the future of critical failures. There. Guys, look! Robert wrote down the working title of his next book. Ooh, what's it say? What's it say? Uh, It says... (laughs) (laughs) Must be a book about Dave's mom. (laughs) What? Damn it, guys. Let me see. Let me see. I know, right? Uh, whatever. Um, are we done yet, Julian? Uh, Can we go get a drink now? Uh, just a second. We hope you enjoy the podcast. There, now we're done. Say goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, Well, that went pretty well, I think. Eh, not too bad. Yeah, it was nice of you to show up, Dave. Yeah, Dave, what the hell took you so long? Oh, piss off, guys. Uh, Hey, look, it's not my fault Cooper's mom is a cuddler. Hey! (laughs) Dave! (laughs) Dave. That's just mean. (laughs) Oh, well. Welcome to Season 5 of the Long-Winded One Podcast. Listen as we showcase original work from top Royal Road authors, read by professional voice actors. Hear interviews from your favourite lit RPG and game lit authors. Lastly, listen as the long-winded one tries his hand at his first ever lit RPG novel, The Four Treasures. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the first episode of season five of The Long Winded One. With me tonight, I have Robert Bevan and Jonathan Sleep of the Critical Failures book series. The reason I asked Robert and Jonathan to to come on for the first episode is because they were my entry point into Lit RPG. With much fanfare and a great round of applause, I would love to welcome you to the podcast. Well, thanks. Thank you. Hello. So uh, just a little background for the listeners. This is going to be the first episode where we're talking about lit RPG and game lit. So I want to start off with a few definitions. So Royal Road, which we're going to be talking about through the course of this season, defines lit RPG as novels where linear progression, such as levels, are main themes of the story, almost always show stat boxes, experience gain, and other notifications. Gamelit is defined as novels set in game-like worlds of any game genre. does not need to heavily focus on visual statistics. Is there anything you guys would add on to those definitions? I think Gamelit is more accurately defined as like the same thing, but people don't want to be associated with lit RPG. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's probably accurate. It's uh, yeah, it's it's lit RPG light is kind of what it it's sort of turned into, and I love that there's been a there's already been like a, a you know a, a fractioning of the genre into like more specific, and of course it goes even deeper than that into other stuff. But yeah, I I kind of lump us the the content the critical failures failures into lit RPG, but really it's more game lit. I guess if you were gonna you know put a fine point on it, it strikes me more as game lit. Sure. And and you could be both lit RPG and game lit too, yeah. right? There's no yeah, yeah. there's no rule I, against that. I feel like game lit is a sub sub genre of lit RPG in a way. Yeah. I guess. Is it, or or maybe it's is it the other way around? What do you think? <laughs> We're gonna well, get some hate mail on this one. Yeah, oh I'm sure. I'm sure. I was into book five, writing book five when uh lit RPG became a term. 
So like, oh well, yeah, this yeah, this wasn't a, a thing, a genre, or a, rec- a widely recognized one at least when I started writing these books in 2012. Pretty much didn't exist at all. When I put out Critical Failures, I did have uh, a few reviews that said, "Oh, this is a ripoff of the Guardians of the Flame series," which is, I think, like from the 70s or something. I had never read it before, but uh, yeah, it was about a a group of D and D players that go into their D and D world, and you know that uh, the premise was the same, I guess. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure my books are different enough. Well, you even had like the uh, the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, the Saturday morning cartoon that was basically, you know, the players got pulled in as their characters into the world. It's not a crazy new concept, you know. It's kind of been around. I know there were like. Russian authors and stuff like that who kind of had early early days uh, content that would technically qualify as lit RPG or something like that. So it's been around for a minute in one form or another, and it's just been very interesting watching in the past 10 years how it's, you know, it now officially has a category in like Audible and, and whatnot. It's like, wow. And has exploded. Well, Jonathan, let me uh, let me ask you your first question here. So tell, tell us, how, how did you get into acting and voice acting? Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks, man, for having us on. And um, I'm proud that we could have been your or we were your first step into the genre. That's pretty cool. Um, occasionally, you'll hear people talk about the books on like Facebook groups and stuff. And a lot of times folks are like, Caverns and Creatures was the thing that got me started in this. So it's always cool to see that. It's like, wow, that's, that's neat. That's really cool. And then they go on to all kinds of other stuff. But uh, but we so always thanks, come man. back. Yeah. We, we yeah. Always come yeah. Back. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. You you were my first, Jonathan. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> touches my heart. Um, how'd I get started? Well, I um, I started, I dabbled a little bit in acting um, in college. I was never brave enough to actually do it before that, like in high school or anything like that. But uh, I graduated from Georgia State with a film degree. And as part of that, I took theater classes and uh, film production and, you know, acting and directing and stuff like that, too. So, uh, it had always kind of been in the back of my head rolling around, specifically voiceover work is something that I wanted to learn more about and get involved in, but I just didn't know how to get into it. Um, took the odd workshop and stuff like that here and there over the years. Um, lo and behold, a good friend of mine, Travis Navarra, who is uh, Saturn V Sound, essentially. He does all of the editing and sound design for the, uh, for the audiobooks. Mm-hmm. Uh, his wife, Vicky, uh, went to high school. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. Went to high school with, with Robert. Nope, that's um, correct. Yeah, in uh, West Virginia, right? Nope. No. Virginia. Where? It was in Virginia. I'm sorry. Yes. There you go. Yeah, it's uh, right east. next door, right? East, yeah. east of, yeah, yeah. That's, what I, that's what I've heard. Uh, but uh, so I guess you guys were talking about it at one point and um no did she, she, how did it how did it go just, actually out of the blue uh i got a message on facebook from vicky yeah. that uh, uh my boyfriend and his friend are interested in producing your audiobooks you know they weren't yeah. married yet at that point right uh and i you know this shows my lack of professionalism you know i'm a self-published <laughs> writer i don't i didn't know what was going on uh, audiobooks sounded like uh, a big headache for very little payoff. I had no idea how big they were. So I was just mm-hmm. like, yeah, all right, whatever, as long as I don't have to do anything. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, one thing led to another. She comes to us and says, hey, do you guys think you might want to do this? And I was like, oh, my gosh, audiobooks, cool. That like, that would be amazing. Uh, what is it? And it's like, well, it's this, you know, this fantasy comedy thing. And I was like, oh, perfect. I love that. That sounds great. Travis had the the studio and the equipment to record it. Um, So we just kind of dove in with both feet, not really knowing anything about it, you know, like, I mean, short of consuming the odd audiobook here and there, Uh, not really having any clear understanding of a a process. And we just kind of figured it out as we went along. And, um, Went from there and, uh, you know, had a good time. Took us a little while to do it, but loved loved doing it. I loved being, you know, behind the mic and being able to voice these characters and all that stuff. And I um, think you do a lot more actual voices than a lot of other audiobooks I've heard. Like more distinct voices. It it depends on the book. Yeah, certainly. Um, The nice thing about these books is that it does let me kind of 
go out there a little bit because it's fantasy characters and stuff mm. like that. So you can kind of stretch out a little bit more, be a little bit more cartoony, um, a little bit more charactery than, you know, straight, dry, uh, you know, narrative stories or fiction or whatever it is. So, uh, so yeah, so we just dove in and took off and have not looked back pretty much. And I've since gone on to do a few other books here and there and um, get into uh, get into other areas of voiceovers, uh, doing commercial work uh, where I can and really exploring that as uh, as a career. And I love doing it. It's fantastic. Well, that's great. And I'm guessing you have your own home studio now. Correct. I do. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But still have Travis do the editing and sound design for the Critical Failure stuff. And occasionally I'll hire him on for other stuff as well as, as I may need here or there. So he's, he's fantastic. He's really good at what he does. Well, thank you for that. So next question is for Robert. So Caverns and Creatures is considered, I th- from what I've read, a parody subgenre of lit RPG where, you know, in, in most lit RPGs, there's, there's this concept of the overpowered main character. That is obviously not our group of heroes. They are definitely underpowered. Can you tell us, is it hard to maintain that? Um, after so many books, right? Because they're, they've been in this world, they've had the opportunity <laughs> to level. Um, is it is it is that hard to maintain over nine books? It's not. No, it's the only way I know how to write. Um, <laughs> it's, it'd be harder if I had to actually learn what they could do. But, no, I've, uh, I'm kidding. They do. I mean, they do level up. And people, when people ask me, um, I, I say they generally are leveling up by about a level per book which is part of the reason I'm trying to take the series to 20. <laughs> when we're all old and gray and... Eh, it'll happen. I just, <laughs> when, I, when a book starts selling again, I'll, yeah. I'll start writing faster. But um, no, it goes back to you know, parody lit RPG. I don't even know. I'm not an expert on, on the genre. I, I, I started off, it didn't even exist. I haven't been like, you know, you won't find stat blocks in my books. The, the, that's bizarre that to Thank me... Thank God. That, people want to read that (laughs) each of the players have a character sheet um where they can you know look over things and i'll make mention of that once in a while but i've even like kind of weaned away from that just because i don't i mean i'm trying to dive in more more in the characters and their stories than you know codifying stats and everything like anytime like hard and fast game rules come into the book it's usually a joke. Yeah. Well, I, I do know that, you know, they, they even carry around their character sheets, right? In, in... Well, they, they did in the earlier books, but like mm-hmm. I said, I, uh, like, I don't know, they put them in a safe or something. And, yeah, uh, I think I they've really been stashed. Them they've been stashed somewhere at the Horse Head Inn or something like yeah. that. And I, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they definitely have, like, Cooper has his axe, right? So they, they yeah. definitely have gotten, you know, more powerful items but oh and more powerful abilities as well i mean you know catherine's been transforming into like bigger animals and, and <laughs> yeah, more often yeah, that's and, true that's true uh you know julian's spells are getting bigger and although he he his you know quintessential spell is still my favorite <laughs> yeah mount horse <laughs> well the best thing about him is regardless of how much they progress they still cannot get out, out of their own way so they're just they're their own worst enemy it seems as far as any real kind of, uh, I don't know, a, <laughs> appreciable ability in, in the game there, it seems. Well, you know what's refreshing to me is um, I think I think a lot of times in books, narrators may just you know, just take, take a gig. Maybe they just like, they're like hired to do this, this audio book. It seems like, Jonathan, you're, you're really invested in this. And that is heartwarming to hear. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been, it's been rewarding in a lot of ways. And it's not just about like, you know, financially it's it like it was a wonderful opportunity for me to like i said get started in voiceover get started in uh audiobook narration uh really stretch out and see what i can do because these books are full of challenges as a voice actor um you know there's a lot of characters and you try try to be as you know original as you can well more or less original i mean it's all tropes but uh uh you know try to come up with new stuff and and uh, keep it fresh and keep it consistent also is the is a really big challenge so it's it's been a huge learning and a huge huge uh education really as far as 
it goes. I'm impressed with how organized you are with that, though. One of the times I came to watch you record, mm. you, you keep a database of voices that you've done in the past so that you can mm -hmm. refer back to them. Uh, you got to at a certain point. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I know, of course, I didn't uh, start with that. That was something that I got, you know, gosh, I don't know, a few books in, probably far further than, than I should have been. Uh, and I was like, okay, I got to, it's time to get a spreadsheet. It's time to start taking samples and uh, having these, you know, ready to go more or less. Yeah. So w one of the other audiobook um, narrators that I've talked to in the past say mm -hmm. they basically go back into old files mm -hmm. and sort of queue up the voices yes. be before they record a part, you know, if they're starting yep. a book after a long time. I have a I have a whole process for that. <laughs> As I'm recording, I've got a, I've got a, I've got them uh, banked into a, uh, or I'm I'm going through and making markers and pulling. If it's if it's a new book, let's just say I'll, I'll make markers and then I'll pull samples and throw them into a multi-track uh, session. And then as I go, if I need a refresher, like oh god, what's this guy sound like? You know, I'll go in and pull it up and hear it, and I have quick reference. It's it's the way to do it for sure. So tell us about how much how much planning did you or Robert do when you first started recording Critical <laughs> Failures? And and then uh, part two to that is how do you decide to make kind of on-the-fly changes? Like, for example, I believe it was Dave's voice that changed uh -huh. from book one to book two. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. No, I'm sure they've all kind of changed from, from book one to book two to book three a little bit. There's some drift that kind of happens there. Um preparation uh so we actually did an audition first and um you know we read through the piece i think it was maybe just like a couple of minutes long uh, if i remember correctly uh but uh, all the characters were there and it was actually the scene i believe it was the scene where they're in the um they're in the wagon and yeah, I think it was in the wagon when they first like transitioned, and they're still like, you know, oh my God, what are, what are we? Why are we in these bodies? And they first pop in, and they realize, like, you know, wait a minute, that that elf kind of is that Julian or whatever, you know? It's kind of like what Dave Cooper, you know? They're all doing that stuff, um, but uh, so we're like, all right, let's do it like this, and we, you know, we kind of had. Kind of had some like, all right, this is a dwarf. This is like a stock voice for a dwarf. Obviously, I'm going for Gimli, Lord of the Rings, right? Like, let's just go for that. Like, John Rhys Davies, 100% was in my head, like, for that initial run on Dave specifically. And then Cooper, real funny, <laughs> was just... He, he sounded like this. He sounded, kind of sounded like Cookie Monster for some right. weird reason, right? I, I told John, I said, yeah. listen, this is a main character. You're yeah. going to have to do that voice a lot. So, uh, and I was like, it, Oh, it didn't sound sustainable. That is not what I can keep doing forever. That's not a good way to do it for sure. So I'm uh, never going to listen to cookie monster the same. Oh way. yeah. Yeah. Like Cooper could have been cookie monster. I'm so glad he's not. He's, he's a, <laughs> he's a more of a Southern cookie monster than anything right now. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, which is a really good point because like when you're reading these characters, you do have, and certainly, uh, for fiction, you, you, you got to do a, a full pre-read of the entire book because you don't want any surprises. Um, you also want, and you've probably heard this from all of the, I hope you've heard this from all the narrators you've talked to. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, you, you know, you want, you don't want any surprises and you also want to have a really good idea of like, um, I guess the weight of each character, like, um, how prominent are they in the story? Because you want to make those very distinct and you want to make them count, you know, you really want to, them to have some importance if they're a key character. So, and also you want to make sure that like Bob said, it is, it is a sustainable voice that you can do. If this guy's got a ton of dialogue, you can't make it crazy, screechy, weird, or, you know, super guttural that's just going to destroy your throat um so yeah all those things you kind of take into consideration how much prep did i really do for for bob's books not a whole i mean i read through it i had an idea of the voices uh but that was really about it and i think bob's only note was maybe not cookie monster for cooper <laughs> and i was like all right cool well let's you know let's let's go let's go ahead and let's hit it so yeah so for those initial that first book, you know, I think I was still feeling out the characters a bit. And I hadn't really, again, rookie 
you know, rookie moves here all around. Like really, like, like the books are pretty much like a a uh, <laughs> watch as this voice voice actor progresses through his audio na- book narration journey here. Like it's really very much that. I definitely didn't get that. I mean, it's very professionally done, and I would have never guessed that. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm sure. If, I'm sure if I listen to it, I'll be like, "Oh my god, did I do that? that? That was an interesting choice there." But um, but yeah, they changed a little bit. Dave kind of settled into his kind of thing. Um, he went from Gimli to. We kind of, I kind of settled on not to give away too much here, but almost like a like a Job character from Arrested Development, like kind of just talks like you know down in that like sort of hey, yeah you know sort of thing. Um, he kind of went around a little bit, uh, changed a little bit, uh, but uh, I don't know. Cooper was kind of Cooper. Um, I think Julian started out much more elfy than he kind of turned into. Like I went like hard, like you know. Again, just the classic tropes, hard Lord of the Rings, World of Warcraft type characterization of these guys. Nothing new, nothing novel. Let's just stick with what we know and uh, and make it work. And then I think Julian kind of, he, he evened out a bit uh, as well. And Tim's just always been Tim. Tim was... Yes. Always. He was, yeah, yeah. I knew who exactly who he was from Go, more or less, so... Thank you. That's That's a background to each of the characters I didn't expect, so thank you for that. So uh, next question is for Robert. Um, so are you are you writing full time now, or or do you maintain? I know you were you used to be a, a teacher, right? You taught in South Korea. Yes. Um, do you do you maintain a quote unquote day job, or are you writing full time? Um, well, I was when I was able to write full time. That's what allowed me to quit teaching and move back to the United States. Uh, and then you know that was going well for a little while. And then yeah, uh, you know, book sales started to fall off. And, uh, you know, that's, so I got out book nine, <clears throat> excuse me. And that was uh, two years, two years ago, right? About that. Yeah. And, uh, and I just couldn't, couldn't keep it up anymore. So I had to, you know, seek other work. And, uh, so that's, I tried to write when I could, but that, you know, uh, you know, I have to work and I got to put food on the table and all that. Don't feel bad, Bob. It happens to all of us. Yeah. Sorry. I had to get that in there. <laughs> but this, uh, this past year, I've really hunkered down. I've been trying to uh, get out my word quotas every day, and I am now about 135,000 words into Critical Failures 10. I'm anticipating it being around 180,000 words long, and I'm just basing that on uh, you know what the past couple of books have been. I've got maybe two or three storylines done, and I've got a bunch of others that are like halfway done so i think that's probably going to be a pretty accurate estimate but it, i don't know it might go as high as two hundred thousand. this uh you know as, as the as the book grows in characters each one of them have all you know their own agendas and things they're doing so it's getting big well they they've it's gotten pretty complex over the the side characters now are no longer side characters if yeah a lot of them so, some of them have really they have their own storylines now, right? Yes, and uh, there's an additional one um, who's been the, like a very much on the sidelines, and he's going to have a full arc in this one. I'm in the middle of writing his right now. Actually, I mean, that's, I'll tell you the truth, it, some of the most fun I've had writing this book. <laughs> well, you always have creative names of the book, right? They're always, they're always punny. Um, you can't, you can't tease that out right now. Can you? Or uh, you well, all right. Yeah. The working title. <sighs> all right. So, so in the beginning, <laughs> this is gonna be good. No, well, nice. eh, maybe not really. <laughs> uh, so I did critical failures and then critical failures too. And, uh, Steve Wetherill from, uh, the authors and dragons podcast suggested fail harder. So I went with that. Went with that. And so from that point, I started trying to do like, puns on actual sequel names from other movies or book series so we had um uh the third one was a storm of s words then uh the fourth one was the phantom pinnace five was yeah five i, I kind of broke with that v is for five mm-hmm. i just thought that was funny <laughs> and then uh i forgot what six was seven was septipussy yeah uh eight was all right eight i uh kind of gave up on it but i had a, right. a dirty joke so i thought i'm definitely calling it this as galleons of seamen 
<laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. What was I? Don't forgot nine. No holds barred. Oh, no that's holds right. barred. Yeah. Very fitting uh, title. And then ten, the working title right now. Not a hundred percent sure I'm going to stick with this, but uh, it's um, X marks your mom. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's great. All oh, right, man. so critical failures six: the good, the bad, and the neutral. Oh yeah, that's, yeah that's a pretty good one. <laughs> You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> well, along with uh, the books, of course, the we cannot forget about the short story collection. Exactly, yeah. I was going to ask about that. Yes. If there are any listeners out there who enjoy the, the novels and have not yet dove into the, 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 the side stories there, please do. There's a bunch of them. Check them out. They're really funny, too. Um, yeah. And Bob writes those along with the novels, and so... Have you released the fourth one? You've got two more to go. Is that correct? Yeah. This, I mean, that whole tradition started after I wrote the first book. I thought, yeah, I don't have the bandwidth to write another full novel right now. So right. I want to, I want to keep my my writing mind limber though. So I'm just gonna write a little short story, and I wrote it, put it out. Uh, people liked it, and it was fun. And it was like really easy going because I didn't have to, I didn't have the weight of a full novel and you know, the consequences and yeah. Whatever, it's a standalone story. So which one was, was that? Uh, that was Cave of the Kobolds. So I did nice. that five more times, and then I thought, you know what? I better stop myself and and commit to writing an, another full novel. <laughs> so that has been the uh, the established uh, thing I do. I, I'll Sweet. do a novel, six shorts, novel, six shorts, and nice. uh, and these later books, instead of you know winding down after a novel, I. I yeah, they've gotten so big that I just use it as an opportunity to wind down between chunks of a novel. So I, I'm putting out a, you know, I'll, I'll write 30,000 words, take a break, write a short and 30,000. So yes, I've written, let's see, what were they? I had Look Before You Leak, mm-hmm. Bread Dwarf, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Alcoholic Gnome. And <laughs> uh, yes, I've written a fourth, Waiting on the Cover Art. Um, that is going to be called. While you're looking for that, I'll say um, the great thing about the short stories is that you can. It doesn't matter where you are in the series; you can pick them up, and um, you don't necessarily have to know what's going on in the stories, right? It's yeah, they're just fun little standalone episodes, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that was and, and that was the yeah. idea. I was, I was hoping these could serve as entry points for people in the series, but the thing is, I don't know if people know that when they see it well it's called something different i mean it's called you know it it's not named critical failures right it's yeah, caverns and creatures caverns creatures yeah so yeah this all right the, the book i just finished or the short story i just finished is called don't get too attached uh the Athatch was a monster in third edition it's no longer in fifth edition well along along the sorry along the lines of the short stories i have actually recorded the first short story so as as those are being released, Bob is feeding them to me. I'm getting started on them, so hopefully, uh, we're, you know, when the last one rolls around, we can get it out real quick and have a quick, uh, quick short story collection release. Let me let me reel us back in here. I have one more question here for for Jonathan before I kind of open it back up. I'm wondering which of the characters is your favorite to voice, and I have an example here that that you could say no, that's wrong, but. Um, like Chaz, for example, mm-hmm. he, you know, he was he started off as a side character, and in these last few books, he's really taken on kind of a more of a role. There's singing involved. <laughs> There's yeah. flo- floating islands. Did you have a favorite character to voice? It's hard. I mean, Chaz is a lot of fun. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, yeah, the the songs and stuff are 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 fun, and certainly provide their own own set of challenges uh to make that to bring that to life but it's fun to it's fun to again stretch stretch out and flex a little bit and sort of do something different um but i think it's like the you know who has who has the lines who are the most fun who who has a character that you can really lean into you know who is a character you can really just like grab a hold of and it for a long time it was Believe it or not, it was Professor Goosewaddle. I really, for whatever reason, I really enjoyed Professor Goosewaddle, and I enjoyed doing the voice, and it was just a lot of fun to perform him. He had like a lot of facets, I guess, to his voice. It was fun to play with, 
And in a lot of ways, Denise is is kind of a, a very much in the same way. Just like you can really lean into to 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 what what she's saying there sometimes, and it's <laughs> awful. It's almost always something awful, but uh, but it's a lot of fun. And um, yeah, a lot of times it's like I can't believe I just said that, but okay, that's all right. I don't know if you were going to ask me a similar question, but Denise is my favorite character to write. That's I get to say fun. things through her that, you know, I, as Robert Bevan, <laughs> don't want to say. Yeah, don't ever want to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, Goose Swaddle, Denise, I mean, I've always kind of liked Ravenous um, for whatever reason. Um, doesn't ever have like a ton of lines, but just fun to play with. Yeah. Just, fun, just as a as a as a voice actor it's just kind of a fun voice to do um well, well as a yeah. side question then mm-hmm. since since you men- mentioned uh professor um hmm. how, how did you um robert how did you pick arby's over a different uh fast food restaurant <laughs> Ooh, i think i know the i don't know i just thought arby's was funnier <laughs> come on man really you don't think rb robert bevan there's not oh, like a secret, no, that never secret code uh, ever in there? occurred to me oh I Where did you, sure. wow, did you just think of that? Jonathan? No, no, I noticed that a long time ago, actually. Yeah. I think we should, uh, we should go with that. RBs. RBs. That's what I'm saying. That needs to be the story from now on. <laughs> I don't want that to be the story. <laughs> All right, fine. I mean, like, I, I come off as playing hard, narcissistic already. Well, this is a question for you both. So w- when can we expect that Critical Failures movie I've been waiting for? <laughs> Ugh. It's, what do you uh, think, Bob? You got any? You got any bites out there for licensing? No, not in a while. It, uh, it's been <laughs> optioned twice, uh, but you know, both times fell through without much happening. Um, and then, and it was like I forget the word, like shopping something. Anyway, it was like an option, yeah. except I didn't get any money. Yeah. Oh, um, what? Yeah, well, That's not much of an option. It's it's, it's just well, a deal to to shop it. Basically, yeah. it's like we'll take it out and see if anyone can. Yeah, that pick up might on have it. gotten a production company, right? Yeah, that might have gotten somewhere, and then, you know, but then COVID hit. I mean, you had a was it a Kickstarter or was it a Patreon or, or something? Yeah, you had? A, a Kickstarter. You know, the first guy that optioned it, he really he made a, a solid effort. He did what he could, but uh, yeah, we just couldn't get the funds, and uh, he, and uh, he was having to take on like too many of the roles for production it was more than he could handle and uh you know the money just wasn't there to uh hire on you know professionals so didn't work out all right well i'm still crossing my fingers for it and yeah uh, it could happen eventually and uh hopefully jonathan you'll be you'll you'll be on board with that just give me just give me ravenous man just i'll just do <laughs> ravenous you can have all your a-list actors everywhere else it'd be nice to be tim that'd be that'd be cool I think there would be uh, people would be very upset if you didn't do all of the voices. <laughs> well, a lot of it's going to come down to if it's uh, live action or animated. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, is there is there talk about a live action? No, I mean, there's talk about whatever you want. Nothing's on the table. That would be awesome too. I couldn't imagine it being live action, but I guess it could happen. Well, I've never imagined it, but now I am. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Well, the the first, you know, the people, the first people that are uh, serious about doing this and optioning it, they, uh, they all had live action in mind, and I was the one that said, "Oh, really? I see it more as animated." But let's go to the next question here, then. So, favorite scenes from the novels or the short stories, and if you want, I'll go first. If if if, sure. if you want, if you want time to think, so I have two. The first one is from Critical Failures number two, and that is probably the funniest, in my opinion from any book it's when they try to sneak the stake into the vampire castle (laughs) and uh they create a masterwork dildo slash stake and have to put it in (laughs) cooper's butt and there's and there's a scene where it comes out of his butt and uh, i was laughing so hard i had to pull over yeah Uh, i think it's dildo hyphen steak but i I could be wrong i could be wrong that's a good scene what was the other one so, so the other one is in number six, and that is, um, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a religious guy, I'm a Christian, but I got to tell you, when you introduced Jesus Christ, Doughboy, to the world, um, I also had, uh, oh my gosh, that mm-hmm. scene where I, I forget, uh, is it, is it the wine that's shooting out? Oh, from yeah. that's that's the end of book four, I'm pretty sure. Doughboy, 
Pillsburg yeah, Doe Child. Child. Do right. Child. Pillsburg Doe Child. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bob, you got you got a you got um, loaded up. Not I guess I got a couple that I'm remembering, and they're both from book three. There's a, yeah, and they're they both they both involve Randy. Oh uh, boy. There was just like this one scene. And no, it's not like the horrible ones that you think. It was just some of the. Uh, was it when they were in it? the real world still, or back? Then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's there's one scene at a gas station where like Tim is trying to like just pump his gas and like he sends Randy into the shop to get oh, something. Yeah. And he, like keeps coming back and uh, oh, they didn't take the credit card or whatever. And like this happens like three or four times, and <laughs> Tim is getting so much more and more frustrated. And he, uh, he he likes you know Stacy in the car. He's trying to keep his cool, but he's he, trying to keep him going off of Randy. And that was a lot of fun to write. And uh, the other one was when um, like they were trying to lure Mordred in you know out of hiding so that they could jump him or capture capture him or whatever to so bring him back to, to the hut. To oh. no, they're they're setting up like a date with him and Stacy and meet at like an Olive oh, Garden yes. or something. And then uh, so they're trying to be. Sed- trying to talk seductively over the uh over the messaging whatever and uh and then randy was referring back to it later he said, said something like, while well, y'all was having cyber sex with mordred <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i've been to that olive garden by the way <laughs> so uh, yeah 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 oh man there's an actual where what what town is it in, Bob? Deiberville, Mississippi. Deiberville, that's right. Drove through there, and I was like, "There it is. There's the Olive Garden." Yeah, it's I a took real a picture place. of the Olive and, Garden with Dick's sporting goods yes, in the background, and so the Dick's is over. What there came too. first was that was it the photo or was it the the? Did you just assume there was an Olive Garden there? And, and no, then actually, you visited? I, no, I was actually. Well, my parents live uh, near there, so I was familiar with the area, but. I was actually in Korea when I wrote this, so I just pulled up Google Maps to see where an Olive Garden was, and I was like, oh, look, there's a Dick's Sporting Goods next door. That could uh, where it all started. Exactly. Well, what about um, you? Uh, favorite scenes. There's a couple that stick out in my head for, I don't know, I guess like performative reasons. Scene where um, Randy, he's like in a house, and he wakes up, and he meets the Pillsburg Doe Child, or he meets Jesus rather, like in corporeal form. Yeah, that, I, I want to say that's the that? end of book eight, maybe. But like, there's like the timer going off on the oven and all that stuff, or the doorbell or something like that. And there's like all these like little neat. It's just weird. It's sort of like just like the surreal scene. It's totally different from like anything else, or it felt totally different than anything else in the books before. And I was like, oh, this just feels really cool for some reason. Uh, and I just really, I loved how it turned out. Like I thought it turned out really well. And then the other scene, uh, it's a neat little part where <laughs> Denise is giving birth to her, uh, scorpion babies. <laughs> and there's that whole thing where, and I don't want to give too much away, but, uh, there ends up only being one left. And, uh, and, uh, Randy's like, oh, he's like, there's just a very like touching moment where he's like, Denise, I'm sorry, you know? And it's like a rare moment of like genuine, uh, you know, care and like emotion that was in there. And uh, uh, I just really liked that. That was like just another moment. I was like, ooh, this is like, I kind of lean into it a little bit. It's pretty good. Well, Randy's one of those, one of those people who, when you first meet, you're probably not sure that he's going to have so much depth, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, like Cooper, like, you know, Cooper's kind of like a, he's, he's a, he's there for comedic purposes, but he's kind of the heart of the team really in some ways. I I think so. Absolutely. And what I like about him is he's, you know, he's a, he's a dumbass, but like the other side of it, he, and I'm sure. I'm sure this is on purpose, Bill, uh, Bob. But uh, you know, he ends up he ends up saying these very poignant and like intelligent things, and it's like without meaning to. And then, he, then, he, yeah, and then yeah, he's yeah, like, exactly. "What did I just say?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's 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 really uh, it's it's nice. All right. Well, with that, with that, um, the last question is just about what you guys are working on right now. Um, Robert told us a little bit about what he's working on. Working on CF10. Yeah. Nice. What about you, Jonathan? Uh, as, uh, yeah, just uh, like I said uh, previously, just the other day, I went ahead and finished uh, recording the first 
of the next uh, edition of the D6 stories. So that'll be, what was it, 96? Yeah, 96. Um, which one did I read? It was Look Before You Leak. So as soon as uh, those uh, get delivered, we'll, we'll finish those up and hopefully have a quick release on that. Short of that, I'm uh, doing uh, other books. I've got one. It's actually a fiction one that's coming out. It's being released by Tantor. It's called, it's a true crime novel. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a true crime uh, novelization of uh, real life experience, essentially. It's called, My Husband's Trying to Kill Me. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, short of that, just being a voice actor, doing commercial work, so on and so forth. That's about it, really. So, so tell us, tell us where we can find you. Tell us all your socials, Robert. You want to go first? Um, sure. There's uh, the main two are the website, uh, caverns dash and dash creatures dot com, um, and then there's the YouTube channel. Uh, just type caverns and creatures into YouTube, you'll find it. Uh, I also have a Facebook presence, but I'm, I'm not as I'm not there as often as I used to be. What about you, Jonathan? Uh, not as much on Facebook either, but um, you can find me on all the socials. Uh, JL Sleep VO is basically my handle throughout all of those. Um, and my website is jonathansleepvoiceover.com. Uh, if you want to learn a little more about me, uh, certainly can go on Audible and search my name and you'll see all the titles I've recorded, plus any that might be pending coming up. And all of the critical failures, novels, and short stories are available there. We're looking forward to number 10 coming out and the short stories coming out soon. We'll be eagerly looking for them. And uh, thank you both for being here and kicking off season five with me. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us down this Lit RPG deep dive. Please consider giving us a review on Apple Podcasts and visit us over at longwinded.one where you can see past episodes and find all of our socials, even our new Discord server. We hope you enjoy.